when we think about building a just and inclusive world, we think about it in terms of social capital, cultural capital, political capital, as well as financial capital. And today we are here to talk about financial capital. Um, it is something that we touch on in our curriculum with our students. We teach them the facts about income inequality. And we also teach them that no matter where you are in the wealth hierarchy, you can use your skills and relationships to create a more balanced and equitable distribution of wealth. Anyone who's familiar with investing knows um, that a small amount of money set aside um, can be uh, can compound over generations to create intergenerational intergener wealth, whether it's invested in the stock market or in housing. Um, it, it has a powerful, powerful impact. Um, and so we know that, um, and we also know just with the example of the African American community in the United States, how when that is not that opportunity is not afforded, it can relate it can result in in generational income inequality. Um, so we know, for example, that today a white family typically has 10 times more uh, wealth than a black family due to 246 years of chattel slavery, subsequent policies of redlining, segregated housing, school, you know, segregated schools, mass incarceration, et cetera. So this speaks to the power of investing um, and how it can build intergenerational wealth. And we also know um, that those who are involved in the investment community can also disproportionately gain access um, to the wealth that's generated from it as we have currently today see the example of, for example, Ken Griffin at, at the CEO of Citadel who earned $1.4 billion in 2017 and is at the center of the GameStop controversy. Um, so we, we know now that, the, and we want to underscore the power and the importance of ethics and social justice and investing. And that is why we're here today is to discuss this important topic with Kristen Hall and Cara Murray Vidal. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now to Lara Mandel, who is uh, the executive director of the Mosaic Project to give a more personal introduction to Cara and Kristen. And then we will be off, um, off on our way for a fruitful um, discussion. And again, we encourage you to put your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, it's a very, very rich topic. Um, and so we'll try to get to everything, but um, we'll, and, and this will be recorded. So um, a, a copy of this video will be sent out to everyone um, after, um, after the event. Thank you, uh, Lara, over to you. Hey, um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Sabrina. Uh, it is my incredible honor to share the screen with three of the most extraordinary women that I know. And I'm so proud to have these three, Sabrina, Cara, and Kristen, all on the Mosaic Projects Board of Directors. It is amazing. Uh, at the Mosaic Project, we teach our children, our students, that it takes all of us, whoever we are and wherever we come from, with whatever strengths and whatever struggles we have to come together, bring our whole selves to the table and work together to create a better world. Uh, and at the Mosaic Project, we also do our very best. It is part of our charter to do our best to practice what we teach. And uh, that includes our incredible board members, as you will definitely see today. They absolutely blow me away with their compassion and their passion for justice. You have never seen such dedicated women. Um, I first met Kristen Hall almost 20 years ago as she was founding a school that was based on justice and equity and inclusion. And she reached out to me in the Mosaic Project and we've been working together ever since. And after years of focusing on education and equity, she's now bringing these same values into investing. She is the founder and the CEO of NIA Impact Capital, and she is an absolute pioneer in the field. And she is showing that you do not have to give up returns to uh, invest in your values. And I have some incredibly impressive statistics here for you. In uh, 2008, um, her funds were up 2% when foundations nationwide were down 28%. In 2020, NIA Global Solutions finished just over 99%, right? And uh, right now their assets under management are at approximately 320 million today and is growing quick, more quickly this year. So incredible uh, demonstrations of what aligning uh, your investments with your values can do. I also want to uh, introduce Cara Murray, also on our board of directors. Yes, I am bragging. Uh, Cara and I met almost 15 years ago when she was a high school student and joined our youth leadership uh, project. 
a youth leader. She was a youth leader and served as a cabin leader at our programs. And since then, she has served in just about every single role in the organization, from intern to program instructor to administrative and outreach director, and now as a board member. And uh, she is currently pursuing her MBA at the Wharton School and her MPA at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And she also works with Kristen Hall, not only on our board of directors, but also at NIA Impact Capital. And I am so excited for them to share their wisdom with us. So thank you so much, uh, Cara and Kristen. And I will now remove myself from the spotlight and turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you everybody for being here today. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Hi, Kristen. Hello. It's good to see you even if we're far away. <laughs> Um, well, I'm super excited for this conversation because I think, you know, a big part of the reason that I wanted to work with Nia was to see if it was really possible to have social impact investing that was truly, um, you know, inclusive, truly, truly thoughtful and responsive to the world that we lived in and that had a real lens on equity and inclusion. And I, I think working with you has taught me so much about this industry. And so I'm super excited to be able to share that today. Um, and I'm looking at the survey poll results and seeing that we have people from a bunch of different backgrounds. And so um, I'm really hoping that we can have a conversation that um, is useful to people at all different kind of levels of knowledge around investing and also with all different kind of perspectives and wealth. Um, because you know, I think that's the goal of, of what you're trying to do from what I understand. <laughs> um, but I think, oh, I can't, I can't hear you, Kristen. Okay, no, just chiming in to say, that's what we're here for to do. And I'm excited to have this conversation. Uh, Cara and I have this conversation on an ongoing basis. So to have it live with all of you um, is exciting. Um, particularly uh, wanna thank everyone for taking time out on their Friday because, um, even though you're probably staying home if you're in California, uh, there are lots of other Zoom rooms to be in and we're, we're thrilled that you're here with us today. Yeah, I kind of want to start with like the hot gossip of the day or the of the last couple of days, the business world <laughs> hot gossip, which is about GameStop. Um, and I was debating whether or not we should talk about it. And then I was like, oh, we should definitely talk about it because it definitely gets at this question of, um, of like fairness and and like the, whether the stock market in general is like an entity that we should uh, be considering and investing in. And I mean, I, I think most people probably know the kind of overview, which is that a bunch of folks who were probably not high earners, probably not um, super familiar with the stock market, were able to drive the prices of GameStop up, um, which ended up in turn affecting all of these hedge fund managers who are normally the people who kind of like control the stock market. And normally if, uh, if a company like, you know, Melvin Capital was doing a short sell, everyone would just kind of get out of the way. And instead a bunch of like you know, kind of normal people, <laughs> maybe not completely normal, but like a group of people who normally wouldn't, who wouldn't normally be invested in this way were able to completely usurp that system. So I'm super curious what your thoughts are about that. Well, I appreciate the question and it's definitely, you know, Wall Street is on in the headlines uh, this week, uh, you know, and, and one company or another or one firm might be in the headlines, but to have this disruption taking place during these times to me is really interesting. And I'll just back up to say, um, we at NIA um, are long only. So NIA means intention and purpose. And what we're trying to do is really bring intention and purpose to every decision we make, both on the investment side and choosing companies, also in the way we run our firm. And I mention that because um, what's happening on Wall Street today is um, shorts and day trades. Um, and that's not our philosophy at all. And yet it is one way I'll say to play. Um, it's, it's risky to do investing in that way. And I would say it's almost more gambling and the hashtag is actually Wall Street bets. And I would say it's more betting in that way. And that's not what we do at NIA. So I just wanna kind of back up from there. Um, one thing that is really interesting about it is one of our philosophies and goals at NIA is to really democratize access to um, investing with values and how can we have everyday people stand up and be part of investment decisions, um, both on behalf of themselves as well as in swaying companies one way or another. So I don't think any of us predicted this this week. And yet it's fascinating to me that the Wall Street vibe or those large firms are shocked and they don't really know what's happening. And the fact that everyday investors um, from Reddit were able to kind of crowdsource this movement is pretty fascinating. And I'm not advising um, 
buying GameStop. I'm also not advising shorting GameStop, um, you know, just to be clear. Um, and just for those that don't know, you know, buying seems like a regular part of our vocabulary. We go to, um, you know, the grocery store or, or we used to go to the grocery store, you know, and, and buy bread. And then we would hold that and use that. And that's, a, that's a buy with a long, because we're going to hold it until we don't need it anymore. A short is, um, and we're not really going to go into all of this on this, but just because it's relevant for this week is when you're basically pushing that away and you're betting against the company. And sometimes you're borrowing money to do that. And sometimes you're using investor money to do that. So it's a really tricky practice. There's some real strong ethical questions about what it means. And so I think what Cara, what I'm hearing you're getting at is what does it mean for everyday investors? And what I'm excited about is that um, I think we've seen in the last year or so that what, particularly when we're talking about racial equity, which is where I want to go and social justice with this conversation, you know, our problem is not really civil um, disobedience. Our problem is really civil obedience, you know, and so in this case, having people say, oh, we're not actually going to play by these rules because they weren't written for everybody and we're going to start um, something that might work for everybody, I think we're on to something. I think we're on to something there. And so I'm definitely following this. And again, our firm is not participating. Um, and yet really watching to see how is Wall Street going to handle this when um, people at home with, with a check can start to participate. And that's where I get excited. And so what we're doing is actually launching a mutual fund, um, hopefully later this year, uh, hopefully in the spring, um, where we can have everyday investors really participate in what it means to invest for social justice values. Yeah, I'm just looking at what, what Dana said in the chat that the GameStop is an indication of how antiquated the financial services system is and that things are changing, investing in your values, racial equity is a part of that. Um, and so I think that I would love to kind of just riff on what you were just saying, Kristen, about starting a mutual fund. Actually, would you mind just defining a mutual fund maybe for folks who haven't heard it, who don't know what that is yet? Sure, sure. Yeah. And just talking about antiquated systems, um, you know, the, our financial system is antiquated. And I'll just back up to say kind of the the history of investing does play into this and it doesn't come from a democratized place. Um, so, and I will get into answering your question about the, about the mutual fund. The, um, you know, the history of investing in this country really started with a lot of the um, pilgrims and the people that were coming from England. And of course there were no cell phones during that time. I don't have to, you know, talk about the lack of technology, but um, they were not a hundred percent sure that they were moving here. They didn't have both feet in this um, continent. Um, and that meant they were sailing back and forth to check on things, um, family members, castles, different things that were going on in England and Europe. And so they were away quite a bit. And why I mentioned that is because they had to have people watching their investments with quite a bit of trust. And because they would be gone and you would have to have people watching your investments. So there was very little communication and there was a high level of trust. And so as we move forward, we've kept very little transparency and very little communication as this system has um, progressed and evolved. And I think that's where maybe we need more disruption and more things. So when we get to what is a mutual fund, the reason I wanted to talk about where we came from is that all of these investment products really are just like, for me, I think about them as um, packages under the tree. And some of them have really, really fancy packaging and some have less packaging. And so a mutual fund has a type of packaging, but basically it's a group of stocks or it's a group of bonds, or it could be a combination. Um, that's the tricky part is we don't know because then you get a ticker symbol and mutual funds have a ticker symbol of five letters and it always ends with an X. So that's how you know it's a mutual fund, but that doesn't tell you what's inside it. And so for us at NEO, we really just wanna be so transparent, um, really pulling away from the index because where the economy, where we lost a lot of people in the economy is this move towards indexing. And an index is the same thing. It's a group of stocks. It's just a really large group. So the S&P 500, which most people are familiar with, is our 500 largest companies in the US. And it's almost impossible for us to know what we're holding if we have 500 things hidden behind this package of this ticker symbol. Um, you know, same thing, some of them have 3,000, the Russell 3,000, or um, 
The Miski Acqui is another one that's got more than 8,000. And I mention that because how can we possibly know what social justice is happening or not happening within any of these companies? What kind of environmental stewardship is happening or not happening? Or is there a GameStop in there? Or is there something else? It's just no one's really watching that. So we're really trying to be more transparent and pull away from that. So we cap the number of companies at 50 because we can really watch them, we can engage with them. And, and this is the part of the disruption that I'm really liking here is that what if we're having conversations with our companies, um, voting all the proxies and really getting involved in governance, that's where I wanna see us moving. And so the mutual fund will give us the opportunity to do that because the minimum, um, both the minimum level and then also the fact that this type of packaging is allowed in 401k retirement funds. Once people in 401k retirement funds have access to awesome investments, we see that they check them more often and they add to their retirements. And so we want to see people growing wealth. Yeah, I think that's the part that, um, whoa, I almost took you down. Um, I think the part that's really, was really, is really important to the mutual fund for me is that like, essentially that anyone kind of at any level, at almost any level of wealth can invest in a mutual fund. And by virtue of being kind of in collaboration with a bunch of other people really grow their power and their ability to, to pressure um, organizations, which I, I know is an important part of, of your work at NIA. And maybe you can talk just a little bit more about that. Like, why is it important to have a mutual fund? Why is it important to be invested in these companies and like be a stakeholder in those companies? And what power does that give you as a, as a organization? Sure, sure. So it's interesting in that um, great questions and thank you for asking. And um, I guess I would say, um, well, it's not typical um, that investment advisors or even um, investors on, on um, just regular investors even understand that ownership I guess we see it as both a right and a responsibility. And I don't know that everyone's aware that if you own a company, you can, and in our case, we feel like we should um, vote the proxies um, about what, who are the leaders, um, who's gonna serve on the board, what is the executive pay? These are all equity issues, um, particularly when it comes to board governance. Um, up until very recently, we've had very few um, representatives of these large corporations um, that are non um, white male. And of course, no offense to the beautiful white men on this call. Um, and yet, we really do need to see more balance in governance. And, you know, diversity is a strength. I don't need to tell anybody on a mosaic call that. And yet, it really does translate when we're looking at our corporations. So, how we're able to incorporate other views um, really equates to strong governance. So, voting those proxies. And then at NEO, we don't stop there. We actually have dialogues with every single one of our companies that open to it. And, um, and that's where we bring our mosaic values into all of this and mosaic strategy. So um, really helping companies understand um, the power of diversity and also inclusiveness. And what does it mean to build an inclusive and positive company culture? Um, and in today where social media, as we're seeing this week, has so much power, it actually has quite a bit of power for branding in, um, in corporations where it didn't before. And I don't need to tell the marketing special as that because that is Cara brings that actually to our team. Um, but just to highlight for this group that um, you know, Tesla is one of the companies that has such innovation. And yet, until they have a really inclusive company culture, um, how can we um, guess that that innovation is going to continue when we know that innovation comes from diverse teams and um, and then the brand risk of not having racial justice as a priority in that company so that's where we raise our investor voice to really get companies thinking and, and kind of welcome them into that this is really a win-win for everyone yeah I think that's that's super important to talk about. And I don't think people actually, a lot of people, I'm going to go like back to the like very elementary to make sure that everyone's like following along. But I don't think people realize when you invest in a company, like you become a partial owner of that company, right? Like in some ways they're like, you know, they are accountable to their, to their stakeholders. You've probably heard that in a movie or something before. And maybe in a movie you've seen like, I own 51% of the stock. I can do whatever I want in this company now. So like what we're saying is that when you have, um, when you are a stakeholder in a company, especially if you're a large stakeholder in a company, you, set, you have some power to shift the culture of the company potentially, right? And that's like what Mia does a lot is leverage its power. Even if, even if we have a fairly small stake, 
like we push as stakeholders of the company, as you know, like people who are do our um, do have a voice in the company to make those changes. So with a company like Tesla, you know, if the stakeholders join together and we're like, we will not accept this company as it is because you don't care about diversity because you haven't prioritized people of color because you haven't prioritized the workers, um, that could really change the culture of the company, we hope. And I think that's part important to understand about what Nia does and like what I think real social impact investing looks like. Um, and maybe it's maybe it's important to kind of talk about the difference between like what Nia does and like I think a lot of companies have like a social impact investing arm and like what is the difference between what Nia does um, and like a company that normally just like invests in whatever but does like you know have a social impact portfolio or something like that. Um, so great question and with you know I don't want to. Uh... Well, I'll just say what we do and how it might be different. Um, <laughs> we, we are with intention and purpose, right? And so we that's all we do. You know, we just invest with intention and purpose um, really because, uh, well, our returns are showing that this intersection of environmental sustainability and social justice really is um, a source of alpha for us. It's also just the right thing to do. And empowering others to come to the table, unlikely investors that maybe didn't feel welcomed um, to this type of, um, you know, a lot of people really, you know, I'll just back up to say, you know, there's only... Um, very few states even require some kind of financial literacy program to graduate from high school. Um, last time I checked, it was 11 states. California was not one of them. And so there's very few of us that actually learned how to do investing. And then there's this kind of, um, I guess I'll just call it a wave of the patriarchy um, for lack of a better term, but there's this shame that comes from not knowing how to engage in our investments. and. I don't know where the shame actually comes from because if you think about it, you know, um, I don't know how to build a skyscraper. You know, I couldn't go to San Francisco and build a skyscraper. I didn't study that. I've never wanted to do that. And I have very little shame. It doesn't keep me up at night, you know, that I don't know how to do that. Um, same thing, open heart surgery. Um, I don't know how to do that. You know, if, if I need open heart surgery, I got to go to the experts and whatever, but I didn't study that and I don't lose any sleep that I don't know how to do that. Whereas in investing, very few of us were ever taught that it wasn't in a high school curriculum. It wasn't in a college curriculum. Many people in an MBA program don't know how to do their own personal investing. It wasn't specifically taught and yet people end up with shame that they don't know how to. So I just want to say if we could just drop that on this call and say anything that you don't know, all questions are real authentic questions. There's no dumb questions. So when we're talking about social justice investing, what does that mean? Um, if you didn't know that before this call, it's totally fine, you know, because most of us don't know that. And so what a lot of firms do is they start with, I kind of alluded to the problem of the index. Um, it was developed in the 70s, kind of got really popular end of the 70s and 80s, which was kind of an exciting concept because this idea of packaging that I talked about before, you could package all of these companies behind one ticker symbol. And then it was really a nice way um, a nice intention for an everyday investor to have lots and lots of companies and exposure and maybe reduce their risks. So instead of say, if you only had, you know, say $500 to invest, how are you going to choose which company when some of them cost more than $100 and how do you make a diversified portfolio with an index is very easy to do that. You can just buy one of those and then you have 500 or 3000. But what happened with that is what I mentioned earlier is that we had no idea what was in that and, and companies weren't behaving well towards the environment to society and it didn't matter, they were still in the index. So what some socially responsible, and this was kind of our first wave was they would pick out the bad players. Um, and so then it was up to them to decide who are the bad players and, um, you know, so it might be because there was alcohol or tobacco, um, you know, sometimes pornography. Um, now, more lately, it's fossil fuels. Um, but for me, that's a very haphazard way. And then you end up picking out what some people are saying are bad. And then you're left with a bunch of, for lack of a better term, mediocre companies. And so what we do at NIA is we're really intentional. We look at every single company and put it in one company at a time, building this portfolio based on our six solution themes. And so that's how we're pretty different is that's all we do. We don't have one portfolio over here and then kind of green it up and put a new label on it to, to kind of sell it here. Um, I do have some issues with that kind of a firm because I don't think you can have one foot in and one foot out. 
I really think you're either dedicated to sustainability and social justice or you're not. And to serve products to, for, to both ends, I, I really wonder how, how you can do that well. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I think, you no, know, we're talking like, sorry, just diversifying, your, diversifying your portfolio was something I didn't understand really until I got to business school. And it's just this idea that you're gonna invest across a bunch of different kinds of like industries and platforms. And the reason you do that is because like, okay, this thing may go down, but this other thing will go up. And you believe that over time, you'll end up with a net positive. So you're, you know, your 401k and all those things are like, your a company usually is investing in a bunch of different stuff that you hope will go up over time to give you a return. And so the NIA portfolio is diversified, I feel. It's just that it's like specialized and intentional about the companies that are inside of it, which I think is really um, unique. And so if you're thinking about investing, obviously you don't want to just invest in one thing, unless you're, you know, like, unless you're a clairvoyant or something and you're like, oh yes, this is the next Amazon I will invest. Or maybe you don't, because Amazon's not maybe a great company, but like, you're like, oh, good, this is a company that's going to change the world. And I know it, but otherwise you want to diversify and have your hands in a bunch of little things because that reduces your risk. Um, so just again, on the, on the diversification, um, really specialized, right? So, um, so in the index fund, to their credit, they are diversifying, and yet to me, you're, there's so much exposure to risk. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what's what we're trying to do is re reduce exposure to risk. And so if you think about fossil fuels, you know, how do you think about that on a social justice area? Well, a lot of the mining um, and a lot of the exploration and a lot of the um, petroleum gathering, refining, shipping, it's actually quite dangerous work. And so there's some issues there about what um, human labor should look like and what it could look like. So but there's also just that that is actually a dying industry. And, um, you know, whether you believe that or not, the, the numbers really are showing that. And so as far as financial risk, as well as reputational risk, um, we would leave that industry out. Yeah, I think that's actually really, I mean, uh, Laura mentioned at the beginning, like how well Nia has done through this 2020 crisis. And I think like, for me, it's very obvious that that's because you're investing in companies that are the future and like the future we believe in like that we want at Mosaic and in the world, right? Is the future that is inclusive, equitable, green, innovative, all of those things. And like those companies did better during this time. And like, that's why Mia did so well. Whereas if you have a portfolio that's full of things that are like dying industries, which is technically diversified because it's a bunch of different stuff, but it's not actually good things. It's not actually things that are like building a better future sort of thing. And in this case, it was actually, you know, dangerous to have those things. It's like just what you talked about. Um, so one example of that actually has been, um, you know, during COVID, how have we all dealt? Um, and as for many corporations, either you're out there on the front lines with your workers, which is felt dangerous, um, or they're all working from home and you don't know what they're doing. And so what we're finding with the NIA companies is that those that had a really strong, inclusive and positive company culture um, weathered the storm much better and they had much more loyalty um, from their employees because their employees felt seen and they felt cared about. And so um, that's been really interesting to watch because those that didn't have that sense um, and whether it was an affinity group for, um, you know, maybe black engineers, um, whether it was a particular group where they had budget to um, march in the, uh, the gay parade in San Francisco or, you know, all these different things really add up to when um, we have a crisis, how are your employees going to, are they going to check out or are they in there for the mission? And so then the other piece is what is the mission, right? And so if staff and employees feel that they are owners of that mission and that they're really tied to that mission and they feel that they're again in an inclusive way, then we saw those companies weather much better and actually have even more innovations during this time. So it was a, it was a great time. I hate that it happened and, and that we're even still going through this and yet it was a good test for our thesis <laughs> as far as what is going to be the next just and sustainable and inclusive economy and then how can we invest towards that? Because um, I don't think I need to say this to anyone on our call, but we get the economy that we invest into. And so if we're going to invest into kind of this incumbent indexy economy, that's what we're going to get. And so how can we shift our dollars towards the things and the companies that, um, that we care about? Ooh, I love that. Like we get the world we invest in. <laughs> like, I mean, we say that with, you know, when we talk about with our work with our kids too, it's like, you know, we're, we're, you know, people are like, oh, we should be doing STEM research or whatever with our children. Like, well, yeah, well, like, we get the kids that we created. Like we invest in like them understanding and caring about social justice, about caring about the world that they live in. Like those investments pay dividends in the future, just like your financial investments pay dividends in the future in terms of the world that we have. So I love that. 
Um, and also, I just want to say, I see all of your questions coming in the chat. I'm going to try and ask as many as possible in the next few minutes. I might, may not ask them right away, but I will try to get through as many of them as possible here. Um, but I think before I start looking more deeply into the, to the questions in the chat, I think one of the things that you and I have talked about a lot is just that the, like the financial industry still is dominated by um, like you said earlier, white men, some of whom are beautiful, <laughs> but like, um, and, and also by wealthy people. And it's like, you know, even with, with Mia, um, you like you have, you're invested in these amazing companies and also like most of the people who are investing big dollars in any, you know, so impact firm, like social impact investing firm or any investing firm in general have large amounts of capital. And so like, how do we balance the fact that we don't necessarily believe that the people who have the most funds in our society should have the most funds in our society. Um, and that like, you know, that these people get, still have a bigger say in, um, in like the way that investments work because they have more capital. How do we, how do we contend with that if we care about justice? Um, such a great question. And so I would love to say, oh, we're just kind of lost our path and we just need to get back on the right path, but really, it's always been that way. And so we really do need to create, you know, dismantle what we have, take down what's not working and really rebuild for, for what could be inclusive and sustainable. And um, I mean, from our governance structures to the way our financial system works. And I think, you know, with, uh, with the elections just behind us, hopefully behind us, <laughs> at least for this season, um, you know, you know, people are, well, should we get money out of politics? And um, yeah, absolutely, we should. That's my firm belief, we need to. And yet, when did it get into politics? And so I think a little known fact that I'll just throw out here, or maybe even question, this should have been one of our polls, but um, who was the um, richest person in the United States when George Washington was elected? I'm curious if you know it, put it in the chat. <laughs> I don't know it, I would guess. Okay, I'll give people a minute. Um, and then I'll let you know why this ties into finances. George um, Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, what are some guesses? Um, so it was George Washington. So George Washington, <laughs> and so it's just a little known fact and I don't know why that's not front page of US history. Like I just, you know, so, so our founding fathers, we give them, you know, credit, and yet, you know, where are our mothers, and where, um, you know, they weren't in the room at the time, and really, who got to be in the room when they set up our treasury, when they set up, you know, um, all of our checks and balances, it wasn't necessarily an inclusive group. Um, and while they might have said they were looking out for everyone and they might have even had those intentions, you know, without really having everybody at the table, we can be in trouble. And so then I'll just go to, um, you know, one of my Mia heroes um, and many of ours is Martin Luther King. And he just had so many, you know, wise uh, wisdoms to say. But one of the things was that, you know, ph philanthropy um, is commendable, um, yet it must not cause the philanthropist to overlook the economic injustices that make philanthropy necessary. And I say that because I always love to bring him into the room and because our systems were really set up by the wealthy. And so our philanthropic system, um, I think it was, it was definitely the Ford Foundation. I wanna say the Carnegie Foundation, um, but it was those families that got called to, white, to the White House to say, hey, can we like broker a deal? Um, and they came up with the philanthropy law. And so to have the wealthiest people coming up with the laws again, maybe didn't serve everybody, you know? So I guess this is a long-winded answer, but Cara, I'm just really concerned. Like, and that's why this week on um, everybody getting in and moving the markets, I think we're gonna have some exciting breakthroughs about what can happen um, and what should happen. And so our piece at NIA is to really empower everyone to, if you haven't started an investment to start one, so kind of to get in the game, get off the sidelines. I know a lot of women, um, and sometimes people of color as well have been felt like they weren't part of the conversation. And so they sit on the sidelines often in cash um, and in, in a bank that maybe isn't serving their best interests. So at a minimum, I would say, let's get that cash into a bank that you love, maybe a community bank that is doing loans um, to members of your community, to women um, and people of color led businesses, um, as opposed to some of the large banks that are causing some, some pretty darn issues, both um, on the environmental side and on um, wage inequality side. Um, so there's a few thoughts, but I knew you had more questions. So keep going, Cara. Well, no, I mean, I, I, 
I mean, I have a ton of questions from a ton of people, but I was just gonna say that, you know, I think one of the things you said to me when I first started working with Mia was like, yeah, like absolutely we wanna dismantle the system and also the system exists right now. And so like, while that money exists, like let's make sure it's invested in the things that we believe in. As long like, you know, we are working to dismantle the structures that we have right now. And also as long as people are still investing in the way that they are, like let's try and get as much of that money out. Um, but I also love what you just said about just like money being power in general and that all of us, even if we're like, you know, I'm a student. So like basically all of my money is negative, but like whatever, like even those, even for someone like me, the, the little bit that I have is, does, could have an impact and could be powerful. And so like for every single one of us, because money is the system that runs the world right now, maybe we want to shift that. Um, but for the moment, like thinking about what we do with our dollars matters for every single one of us. And that doesn't mean that it's just or equitable or that we should be like content with what we have, but we should consider that um, that our, our money does have power, at least in the, in the current system. Um, exactly, I, exactly. And just on the dollar side, like when we're shopping, you know, we can support black owned businesses, we can support local, we can do organic or fair trade, or, you know, we can match our values when we're thinking about our shopping. It's the same thing with investment products or banks, you know, banks are, are a service industry that could be, you know, we can be choosing black owned banks. I use beneficial state bank, um, because they're run by a foundation that matches my values, but there's and there's um, there's just many options for us to really think consciously about the decisions with our money, which sometimes, and I hope it's not nefariously on purpose, um, but our money is definitely separated from um, most of the decision making we make as far as where we keep it. It the nothing is neutral. That every institution that we use has. Um, you know, operating premises and how they act and behave in the world. And so can we just bring that conscious lens about, um, you know, making sure that our money is at least sitting in an institution um, that we value that that matches our values. Amazing. Um, I want to pop into one of the questions that was in the chat that was like, how do you measure social impact? How do you calibrate across impact areas? How do you measure and quantify company performance and race and gender equity? Um, environmental impact as compared to pay equity. Like, how do you how do you measure your dimensions of impact when you're deciding what companies? Okay, really great questions. And so we start with our six solution themes. Um, those are on our website. We can throw those up there. Actually, Kelly might be on this call and could put those up there. Um, I'll. So I developed the six solution themes in 2012, and how I did that was I was just asking myself in a systems thinking kind of way, if we started with the end in mind and we invested in what mattered to get us to an inclusive and sustainable economy um, and a world, what would that look like? And then what would, what are the things that we need? So um, healthcare for those that don't have it. And so the way we define that at NIA is we really look at women's healthcare and then people of color. Um, and so we ended up, and then also, I guess, uh, you know, my first W-2 growing up in high school, I worked at a florist shop. And so I really grew up in the 80s in the Bay Area, um, in the gay community. And so I lived through what was a pandemic at that time, and that was HIV and AIDS. So I've always really cared about and watched diseases that affect people that are not in, um, I guess, the mainstream of health and how does that happen? So, so the portfolio does really watch for viruses um, because they generally end up affecting um, in disproportionate ways. So um, we were very well positioned, of course, for this current current virus because we do follow those. Um, so that's healthcare. We also think about sustainable transportation. Can it be equitable? Um, and how can we get both the people and the things where they need to go? And what does that look like? And what are the components for that? Um, education is really important to us, of course, uh, as far as democratizing and providing access with communications. And then sustainable planet is kind of an overarching theme. Generally, we're talking about energy efficiencies and then also everything that um, could fall from the sky, like solar that we can harness or that will blow and we can harness that in a wind uh, mill like technology um, and then get it to the grid or off the grid. So a lot of sustainable um, topics and themes. So we start there. Um, we're looking for companies. We, we really start with their revenue base. How are they baked? We want to know, are they baked with purpose? And so along our six solution themes, 
They're highly aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we use those as a framework as well. And we're not looking to see like to Chevron and no offense to anyone that works at Chevron. It's just such an easy company to pick on in these days. Um, but you know, their, their core service is, and their product um, is fossil fuels and petroleum. And so that wouldn't fit into our solution theme. So the fact that they also do some giving in their community and they also might have women on their board of directors um, doesn't really matter to us because we really start with how is this company baked and what is their core reason for being? So that's our main thing. And then we're looking for inclusivity and can they keep up innovation by including um, a positive company culture? So then we're looking for practices and policies. And one of our big... Um, ones that we really speak out quite quite loudly about is um, forced arbitration. So we wanna know that employees have rights um, when they sign on. And um, so if you have a company that is currently using mandatory arbitration, we will be having a conversation um, and we will hope to get, to get some support there to, um, because it's associated with both sexual harassment and um, racial discrimination, we want to make sure that you don't have, as a corporation, policies that could be inhibiting um, the inclusivity of your staff. Yeah, do you want to just say a, like a second about what our forced arbitration is? Sure, sure, absolutely. And so it's actually in so many products that we buy, like the cell phones that we have, um, there's a clause somewhere that says that if we have an argument, we can't take it to the courts. Um, and while we're not taking on the products that you actually buy, we're, we're doing it more on the employee side. Um, because that's where we really see our voice coming as far as higher leverage for, for corporations. Um, so what happens when you have, well, actually I'll just back up to the history. Um, the courts back, I wanna say this was in the, 30s when this happened, but the courts were getting tied up with all these business things. And so the men, and again, the beautiful white men at that table thought, well, we're just going to alleviate the courts. And, you know, these are just business things. It's just like, a, you know, who paid who what, not a big deal. Let's just throw these over into arbitration to free up the courts because they were too tied up. So I don't think it was a nefarious. I don't think that anyone, we just didn't have the people at the table to say, oh, actually, when there's sexual harassment or racial discrimination, we need the courts. Um, and that keeping those particular items hush hush and covered up um, without the, um, the ability to go to the press or the ability to, to, to get a jury trial, those perpetuators um, and the perpetrators will perpetuate because there's no attention coming to them and they're getting a little slap on the wrist instead of really changing what could be a really negative risk-filled company culture. So that's why it's really important to us is um, um, I'm not trying to say everyone should lawyer up and yet when um, sexual harassment specifically and racial discrimination are not open, then, then no one gets to see. And it's also a risk to investors if we, don't, if we don't have a window into what's going on in the company. So we're doing it more on the protection of the employees um, and to build the company culture, but that, it's a big deal for us. And, um, and it's generally just an issue in the US because the law shifted at that time many decades ago. So it's just really time to redo the law. And I actually, we're working on policy as well. So I think there's there's, there's hope in this Biden administration that that it may be eliminated anyway. That's cool. So it's basically like it's like oh this happens inside the family, so we're gonna keep it in the family and no one else can know about it. <laughs> but like actually, but if you're like abusive, then maybe somebody should know about it. Um, and that's like a practice that is happening in a lot of businesses where like if something happens, they like keep it within the business. You sign a contract when you get hired, saying like we're never gonna take this to the court when sometimes it like needs to be public, um, the bad things that are happening inside of your company. <laughs> um, but yeah, that would be- Inside those, so just they often go hand in hand with an NDA, meaning that you're not allowed to talk about yeah. it, mm -hmm. um, which is, and so, and just, just to the credit of the, some of these companies, like sometimes in NDA, when you're sitting on a super important innovation, um, you know, or some new technology, of course you need that NDA. You can't just take this from one company to another and go sell yourself. It's when there are really strong issues of discrimination, that's where we want the voices to be louder. Cool. All right, I think we've gotten a little bit in the weeds, but I know that folks are, are interested about this. Like, I mean, this is all exciting to me, but I wanna make sure that um, we're getting through people's questions. And I, I saw a question earlier that was just about like, if you are wanting to invest, what, like, where do we start? And I think the question was specifically about like, if you're part of an investment committee or something, 
Um, and you know that this is important, but like, where do you start? And I, I would also love to add, just like, if you're an individual who hasn't really ever invested before and you care about, you know, whatever small amount that you can maybe invest, like, what would you do? So between like big, you know, investment committees to like all the way down to the individual, where's a good place to start? Sure, sure. Well, so, and there's no one starting place for anybody. So it doesn't matter. Like we all have our own entry points. You know, we all have our own favorite colors. We all have our own personality styles, you know, so there isn't like you have to do it this way. So it's really what feels comfortable. And then also what you can get done in the week, because just like we weren't all, um, you know, had investing 101 as a high school course, um, or personal finance, we also don't have Thursday afternoons just set aside to do this, you know? So, so how is it to fit it into this day um, or this week or this lifetime, right? And so my, my um, encouragement is to just start wherever you can. So sometimes that's checking out a new bank, you know, just moving over your, your cash and your, your checking account to a bank that matches your values. Sometimes it's looking at some of the fixed income. So um, C note, and it's um, the website is my and then C N O T E. We could put that in the, um, in the chat. Um, they are a great place as a cash alternative and a fixed income. And that's not part of our company or anything. We just, it's a women led out of Oakland. Um, and they do a wonderful job with CDFIs, which are our local lending institutions, local banks, um, and they can customize. So they actually have a, um, a wisdom fund that is helping um, or just it's loaning money to women of color led businesses. Um, they also have a COVID fund for the small businesses that were hit hard in the last year um, to get money out to them. So, so those are some really interesting ways and the, and the interest is generally more than you would get at you know, your local bank. As far as what we do at NIA in the stock market and building a public equities, again, we're hoping to launch this mutual fund and, and when and if we do and we get approved by the SEC, which we anticipate we will, um, the minimum will be either 500 or a thousand dollars and that will we'll know you know if we can do that by may we'll know before that but then we'd be able to launch in may um minimums at most brokerages like schwab fidelity jp morgan etc is about a hundred thousand and that's because of this different type of packaging that i was talking about that that those types of um, organizations require um and then there's a place called folio that does and this is getting pretty into the weeds but i'll just say they do fractional shares and i do think that's our future so you don't have to own an entire whole share of apple or tesla or etsy or any of those and so the minimums can be lower so the minimum there is ten thousand, and we really like that we want to bring it even lower um there's also some books so um just i'll just throw out there i write the money doula blog and um i try to put short easy um hopefully compelling things about getting people motivated about moving money and issues um there's also a book that's just out called the global no i gotta remember the name of the book i wrote a chapter on gender lens investing for it and it's just out and it's by wiley and i think it's called the global cam book for impact investors and um i'll figure that out and put that in the chat too global handbook for impact investing right here oh paul thank you That's for it. being here put it in the chat okay we'll do so it. Paul, <laughs> uh, uh uh, thank you for being on this webinar. I don't see you. You're out there somewhere. And um, he is the editor and pulled together 30 experts from around the world um, uh, to co-edit this book. And it was a huge lift during 2020 to pull this all together. So big shout out to him. He, uh, Paul also runs um, really responsible portfolios at HIP and it's HIP, Human um, Impact and Profits. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that work. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, I, I want somebody asked a question earlier about if Nia is, only has $100,000, um, like if that's the, the minimum, which is, is not true. And you can kind of, at this point, you can kind of invest at any level. And when the mutual fund is released, then that'll be even more true. Um, and so I, I think Kelly put in the chat, like, feel free to follow, to get on Nia's email list. So that way you're getting updated if you're interested in joining the Nia portfolio. I'm not even here to sell me. Yeah, I'm just saying if you're interested, <laughs> like that's a great way to stay involved. Um, but I think one of the one of the other things I wanted to ask you about that someone was bringing up in the chat as well um, was about um, how do you like you personally go through and, and choose like are you are you choosing your own or like or is there a team of folks who are figuring out how this works? We have a team. We have a team. I make all of the final portfolio decisions right now. 
Um, and yet it's a team effort for sure. And we are looking to change the face of finance. So we're always looking to bring more people into the fold that would be interested in learning about sustainable finance. But at this point, I'm the, the main portfolio manager. Awesome. Um, sorry, that was an easy question, but I do want to just go back to what you just said about, um, about like just what you can do in the moment and that kind of anyone has options, right? Like obviously not all of us can like, you know, quit our jobs and spend our days looking at portfolios and trying to figure out our best, our best options, but we can like maybe start by again, switching your bank, investing a small amount in the company that we believe in, or just like whatever you, whatever excess capital you have investing it in, in like, even if it's a community organization that you believe in. Um, so just kind of like meeting yourself where you are and thinking about what are your financial choices that are already happening, um, that you're already making could be more aligned with the values that you have. And I think, you know, like hopefully we will all one day be like, our money will be completely aligned with our values. But in the meantime, like take a look at where your money is. Even if you don't have a lot of excess for money, like even if, you know, like as soon as your money goes into your bank account, it goes back out to your rent and your electricity and all of that, where is the bank it's sitting in for that little intermediary amount of time? Is that a bank that has values that you believe in? I love that as a kind of an important reflection on the way that you manage your, your money. Um, but we have been talking a little bit about like risk in general. Um, and like, do you think there is a trade-off between returns and doing good? Does there have to be a trade-off? Um, well, it's really interesting because I feel like, um, you know, when certain political parties kind of grab the, uh, the rhetoric and they win by that rhetoric and it wasn't even true to start with and you go, how did they do that? That's what happened here is, um, and there were some, I think some funds that got a lot of press that weren't doing well. Um, and again, I think it was those that were based off an index and they pulled out some of the bad players um, and then it performed a little bit less. But uh, I think that the concept of investing um, for good, um, for some of the reasons I talked about earlier, you know, just particularly in this crisis, those companies that are working on the very solutions that we need can be in alignment with your values. And if they're well run, they can also, um, you know, really execute um, in, in times of crisis. And so that's what we're seeing is that this intersection of environmental sustainability and social justice has been a significant driver of alpha. And so alpha just meaning how can you, um, you know, make returns over the index or over what the market might expect. And so um, I guess I would say I'm here to dispel the myth that, uh, that, uh, that, that really never was true. And, um, but somebody had some really strong marketing and got that out. <laughs> um, and someone asked earlier about like navigating the complexities of a company, like if it's environmentally friendly, but then maybe they, you know, do something like, uh, you know, exploit labor in another country. Um, and I think you kind of touched on this a little bit where it's like, you know, a company may be very innovative, but have terrible company culture. And so I think how do you kind of like navigate those lines between a company that maybe has some great things going and some other things that are not. And I think maybe I'll add, like, is there a point in which you're like, actually, you know what, this company, like, we thought that maybe they could change the things that they were doing and they really don't seem to be doing that. So they're not going to be a part of this portfolio. Oh yeah. So it's, so there's no perfect company. I mean, that is, you know, there's just no perfect company and we have ones that we really, really like. We engage with every single company because we think they can do better. And just as human beings, we can all be learning and doing and have in, and adopting better practices or practices of this time. We generally invest in those companies whose products and service core products and service are things we really believe in. So we're not generally advocating about the product and service. We might be advocating about more transparency in the pipeline. Um, however, if you end up finding slave labor or child labor or anything in a pipeline, you know, that's an issue that you really need to discuss, right? Or, or depending on, you know, most of us, we would say, oh yeah, we really have to discuss this. Non-starters for us are um, executive teams or boards of directors that are entirely male because we're looking for diversity. So if they have a low end and are willing to work with us, listen, and we see them moving forward, then we absolutely will start with even one. Um, you know, which seems crazy. And yet we're also on um, the policy side really advocating for, um, in the case of California, um, it was last year, actually the year before um, with the COVID brain on, was SBA 2.6. Um, and so that got signed into law and we were really excited. We were strong advocates of that. And so any company that IPOs or goes public um, onto a stock market um, exchange in California is required to have a diverse board. Um, and so we're really excited. And so now um, the culture of Silicon Valley can change from the 
you know, closer to the beginning, or at least as, as companies get further baked. So, so we're really excited about that. I would say another thing just to mention now, and I know we're running short on time, but just managers, you know, I am a female manager. You might not meet another one in your lifetime. There are so few of us. And so um, I found out from a night study, they, they um, commissioned Harvard last year and also in 2017 to study um, diversity and asset management. And I just, if you're thinking of moving money with values, it turns out that um, 1.3%, so people of color and women combined make 1.3% of those running money um, and managing assets. And so when we talk about how did Wall Street get so out of balance, it always was out of balance and we, we need to have more decision makers. And so that's also something to look at is um, each fund that you're choosing definitely do look to see who, who are the fund managers. Yeah. I, yeah, I think like I've learned from Nia and also from being in business school that there's just like such a dearth of people of color and um, and women in the financial industry throughout that like goes for venture capital as well. Like, you know, being women and people of color are way more likely to, way less likely to have their um, companies and ideas invested in. And so that's why it's like super important now that people are being intentional about trying to figure out how to fund, um, you know, innovators and business makers and managers who are who are people of color, who are women. Um, and that's another way that we can each be intentional about the work that we're doing. Like we're investing in a company or we're doing a startup, looking at like how that board looks, looking at who the funders are, looking at what the, the place looks like when you're deciding where to invest and who to invest in and being intentional. Um, we are running up around time. I know I, technically I think this event was allowed to go to 1.30, but we're trying to keep everyone, um, we're trying to keep everyone happy and not getting Zoom fatigue. But I do want to make sure that we answered any questions. So if there's any questions that you didn't get a chance to ask over the course of the event, I'll leave a moment just for you to ask any questions. Um, oh, ESG back into 401k plans. So maybe that's a good thing to talk about just briefly is 401ks I think are probably the number one way that like an average person has um, a little bit of excess capital or is working towards investing like how does that how does your how can you align your 401k with your um with your in, with your values is, is there a way to do that okay so that's the trickiest question right now and i yeah. didn't realize we were going to 130 i actually do have to end so okay. what i'm just convinced <laughs> you is that um, we can send the chat and I'll type up any answers to and happy to send those out to people. Um, I do want to say that using your investor voice, going to your company to say, I want better options because um, the indexes just also can't drive the returns in the way that some of these more responsibly led um, firms can. That's just, I think that's the way the world is, is um, happening right now. So definitely letting your firm know that you want specific um, products. That's how the, the industry does change based on uh, uh, client requests. Awesome. All right, well, we will go ahead and wrap it up. Um, I don't leave yet because there's a couple of important things I want to make sure you information that people get before you leave. Sorry, Kristen, you're allowed to leave, but like, I want to wrap up for everyone else. Um, I think the first thing is that this, there is a recording of this. You'll get the recording um, if you were, um, if you missed some portion of it. Several people have asked me that. Um, the other thing is that um, if you're interested in Kristen's organization, I highly recommend that you go check out the website. I mean, I think the very last thing is that we touched on a little bit is about the question about like philanthropy versus um, impact investing. And we do believe like, because we're board members of Mosaic, we do believe that philanthropy is another kind of investment. And obviously that investment is different, right? Like you invest in a, an organization like the Mosaic Project, which believes deeply in bringing people of different backgrounds together and breaking down the walls of segregation. We believe that does pay dividends as we were talking earlier. We believe that that does give us motive, give us an ability to create the world that we're looking for. And so that we may not get a financial return when you're being philanthropic, when you're just, when you're giving money or donating, um, especially if you're donating to an organization like the Mosaic Project, we think that that has a true impact in our world. Um, and so with that, I would love to say um, the Mosaic Project, you can donate right there. <laughs> we're just reading it in the chat. And also we're having our community fundraising brunch that's coming up on um, February 27th at 10.30 a.m. Um, we'll be sending out more information about that. So please get on our email list and keep an eye on our website for that. We're doing kind of a new way of doing it. Obviously our brunch usually is in person, um, but this year we have some really cool innovations and we're gonna be able to take a virtual tour of the new site, which is where we'll be working with our fourth and fifth graders to create that, um, the world that we're talking about. So thank you all so much for being here. We super appreciate your time. Um, another thank you to Kristen for being with us today. Um, Laura and Sabrina, did I forget anything?
Are we good? <laughs> Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. And again, if you have questions, I heard that um, I heard Kristen volunteer there. So feel free to reach out um, if you have questions that you weren't able to ask in the in the um, in the discussion today. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.